Hello and welcome. My name is Guilherme Gondim, and I'm the head of the Science and Technology section of the Brazilian Embassy in Tokyo, and most importantly, a passionate gamer. Thank you for taking the time to join us today as we discuss the Japanese gaming market, specifically the opportunities and challenges for overseas developers. I would like to also express our gratitude for the speakers today. Thank you for accepting the invitation to share your knowledge and experience in such an interesting topic. As we all know, one cannot talk about video games without referring to the giants such as Nintendo, Sony, and Sega. In Japan, video games are an important industry, the everyday hobby of millions of consumers, part of the country's modern culture, and an element of its international projection. We need only to remember the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe rising from the field in Maracanã Stadium wearing a Super Mario costume. This webinar is organized in partnership with Abra Games under the Innovation Diplomacy Program. Since 2021, we've been working together to promote the Brazilian gaming industry abroad. So the Brazilian Game Week project, fondly known as BGW, our network of embassies and consulates in 25 countries shared relevant information about this growing and dynamic area of Brazil's economy. You can find more information on the links now shared at the chat. The session today is live open to the general public and is being recorded. So please, we ask the audience to close their microphones and cameras. There will be a time for questions and answers at the end of the session. I'd like to now invite Abra Games President Rodrigo Terra to say a few words. Thank you, Guilherme. Uh, good morning, good, good night, and good morning for everyone, all attendees and speakers here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, on behalf of Brazil Games Association, Abra Games, uh, would like to thank uh, Guilherme Gondi and his team at the Brazil Embassy in Tokyo to putting together this great and incredible session, one of many, I, I definitely hope. Uh, of course, we would like to, to extend the, our thanks to the Innovation Diplomacy Program carried out with Brazilian Minister of Foreign Affairs, which is an important player in getting to the game together. Uh, with uh, Abra Games in this endeavor of promoting our gaming development ecosystem and our um, market that is getting mature day by day, right? Abra Games, the Brazilian Game, the game Companies Association was founded in 2004 and represents Brazilian studios developing games in all platforms, and we have studios across the whole country. Uh, besides catalyzing game production in the country by training and promoting expertise, Abra Games aims at, aims at making Brazilian creativity and technology available to the main players of the international game industry. We also would like to thank to take this opportunity to thank the Brazilian Trade and Investment Promotion Agency, Apex Brazil, in our partnership, uh, Brazil Games Export Program, which is a very important program for us here uh, in the country, uh, for their constant support over the past nine years of cooperation in promoting the Brazilian game industry internationally, developing new business opportunities for our companies. And obviously, again, thanks, Guilherme, who is one of the mentors here of this approach to the to the Jap Japanese ecosystem. One of the markets that we as consumers or gamers we love so much, but it's now it's the moment time to to keep closer with the, the developers and show how mature and interesting is our game development ecosystem here in the country for the Japanese market. Yeah, you, Guilherme, you're muted. Yeah. Sumasen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Uh, uh, so without further ado, let me introduce our first guest today, uh, Sho Sato. Sho is the CEO at Ludimos uh, Incorporated, a, co a company working on international expansion for digital and non-digital games, animation, manga, and other content industries. Before Ludimus, uh, he worked for Media Creates, a Media Create for eight years, which provided marketing data for, used by uh, most Japanese gaming publishers, such as Nintendo, Sony, Square Enix, and Konami. Beside the Japanese game market, uh, he's also a market research specialist in emerging markets uh, from uh, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Middle East. Uh, he's a mentor at Game Founders and also an inv invited speaker at various international events for game developers. Welcome, Sho. Yeah. Yours. Uh, 
Oh, uh, th thank you very much for your introduction, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, uh, good, good evening in Brazil. Uh, good morning in Tokyo. Uh, so, uh, so, so today uh, I'm going to. Uh, my name is Shosato. Uh, I'm a CEO at uh, Ludimus uh, Inc. So uh, today I'm going to talking about the kind of the, how can say brief introduction about the Japanese in market. So uh, I will share my screen. Yeah. Hi, and nice to meet you. Wait a minute. Uh, let me let, let me share my screen. So, can you see that? Okay. Then uh, let's move on. Uh, so, since uh, I, I just I just have uh, just a fifteen minute fifteen minutes today, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, let me let me let me introduce myself. Uh, so, my, I'm I'm a kind of a, how can I say uh, international researcher in the Japanese market, and uh, especially for the how can I say uh, my my how can I say. Uh, uh, uh let, let, let me let me explain uh yeah my uh before i i founded a uh, ludimus ludimus uh uh i uh, i worked in the media create media create is a kind of the how can i say game research institute uh like in the how can i say uh, npd in the us or for example i a uh, itg or uh like a, a such company in the us or the gfk in europe yeah, uh, we uh, I made a kind of a, how can I say uh, ex extensive research with about the uh, domestic game market and uh, uh, how can I say the emerging game market like the uh, Asian countries or Middle East or Afri even if African countries uh, visiting a very uh, visiting various countries uh, and. Uh, yeah, so that's why how can I say my first work is to making a report toward the big Japanese game publishers and uh, platformers like the Nintendo, or Square Enix, or Konami, or Micro, uh, or Konami, or for example like the Square Enix or Koei Tecmo or yeah, such companies. Yeah, and uh, I, I I'm also how can I say uh, made a uh, various uh, lecture about the Japanese game market and then uh, other Asian markets. Uh, for the uh, various international game developers. And uh, I was an invited lecturer uh, in the Asian countries or African countries and uh, Europe, European countries. But uh, I'm so happy. Uh, it's, it's really my honor to make a presentation uh, toward the Latin American game developers, especially for the Brazilian game developers for the first time in my life. Uh, and uh, I'm also the kind of the, how do you say co-founder uh, of EG Indie Game Incubator, uh, which is the kind of first, very first incubation pro uh, program for indie game developers in Japan. So today, this is today's ag agenda. Uh, first, I'm going to talking about the kinds of how can I say uh, uh, kinds of rough things, uh, rough numbers, and uh, uh, some information about the Japanese game market. And then uh, later, I'm going to talking about uh, some case studies. And then later, uh, 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 and uh, on the third part, uh, I'm going to talking about the game publishers uh, and the condition of game publishers uh, for uh, in view of the uh, international game developers. Uh, and uh, finally, I'm going to talking about the uh, opportunities for the Brazilian game developers in Japan. First of all, first of all, uh, uh, I was uh, I was in the research institute, and uh, uh, I'm, I was uh, I have been wondering why we don't have a kind of a, how can I say a unified number? Uh, because the, how can I say there are some many research institutes in Japan. Uh, uh, making a research about the Japanese game market, and uh, their number is very, very different. Uh, so that's why uh, this time uh, I just bring the number from uh, CESA, uh, Japanese uh, Game Industry Association. And uh, according to them, uh, the Japanese game market is like the uh, $13.8 billion. Uh, and uh, they, 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 among them, 77% uh, uh, of the uh, game game market uh, come from uh, smart device game. I mean, the like the smartphone games or the iPad games or such. Uh, yeah, such games. And meanwhile, uh, the console game uh, has a, a good number of share uh, compared with uh, other countries. I think uh, the 
game console console software uh, is like the nine nine percent, while the console downloads uh, occupies the one percent. And the uh, console hardware, I mean, the like the Nintendo Switch or PlayStation Four, uh, outputs the uh, ten percent. And uh, yeah, kind of how to say. Strange thing about uh, this data is that um, this don't include the Steam game market. But uh, recently, a very recent study uh, by GameAge, another research institute in Japan, they say that the Steam market in Japan is around uh, three hundred forty-seven point six million dollar. Uh, it's a kind of similar market size to the uh, Canada. It's smaller than the Germany or the Japan, uh, Germany or France, uh, Germany or France or uh, other um, bigger European uh, Steam market. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I like to go to the uh, Steam sales uh, data in Japan. Uh, according to the how can I say official data. Uh, the Japanese, uh, the how can I say, the game users uh, of Japanese game users in Steam uh, is like the two two point three four percent of the total uh, total game users, uh, uh, total worldwide uh, game users, and uh, it seems that uh, how can I say, it, uh, it's a uh, you, you may think that uh, it's a kind of small number uh, compared with the other market. Uh, like the friend, France or German or Spain or other uh, uh, other countries, but uh, uh, meanwhile it's very interesting uh, number I think because uh, how can I say uh, three or four years ago uh, the the Japanese game Japanese uh, game users uh, just occupy like the one percent or such things. So it means that uh, how can I say it uh, it doubles uh, its numbers uh, within the uh, recent uh, few years. Uh, so I think uh, it's a good move. I think, yeah. And uh, also the how can I say? I also put the how can I say? Ranking, uh, recent ranking about the uh, Steam sales uh, data uh, in Japan. Uh, this is the kind of top sellers uh, about uh, uh, indie games uh, in the uh, in Japan. And uh, so some of them can come from uh, kind of the Dojin game from Japan, uh, which is the kind of the, how can I say? Uh, longer uh, longer tradition uh, of the amateur uh, amateur gaming uh, amateur gaming development uh, in Japan. Yeah. So, meanwhile, uh, 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 for the next, uh, I I like to uh, move on to the mobile game market in Japan. Uh, yeah, here here is the sales data, and uh, actually uh, compared with the other countries. Uh, other international other countries like in the U.S. or the France or France or Germany, uh, how can I say the the most of the how most of the uh, uh, how can I say Japanese Japanese game titles uh, occupy the most of the ranking um, into the how can I say uh, Japanese mobile game market. Uh, uh, also in the uh, how can I say uh, f f downloads uh, downloads and uh, paid games and uh, top grossing. Meanwhile, uh, recently uh, Chinese game uh, game companies uh, make a how can I say great success, uh, like Genshin or yes, yes yeah like Genshin or the uh, other titles, and uh, they made a really uh, strong uh, marketing promotion uh, inside the Japanese game market, and then they get uh, how can I say higher share uh, than ever before. And then also, uh, how do I say? Some uh, hyper casual game companies uh, have a uh, how do I say smaller opportunity, but they also have a uh, such opportunity uh, also in Japan uh, if if they have a kind of good localization. Uh, let, uh, and uh, uh, as for the how do I say Brazilian games? Uh, psych uh, recent, recently, uh, you can you can find. Uh, how can I say some news uh, about the Brazilian games or or some interviews about the uh, for the Brazilian game uh, game developers? Yeah, uh, I, I just uh, pick up uh, some examples. Uh, for example, uh, on uh, on the center uh, in in the center of the page, uh, this is uh, this come from Famitsu, the largest uh, game media in Japan. Uh, they make a, they make a, how can I say. Uh, review about the uh, blazing chrome. I think uh, it comes from uh, Brazil, right? And uh, also uh, in the 4Gamer, uh, 4Gamer is a kind of, how can I say, largest uh, online game media in Japan. Uh, they also uh, deal with uh, 
uh, Brazilian uh, game game title called uh, Dolmen. And uh, it's GameSpark, another game, uh, big game media, uh, they also, how can I say, make an interview about uh, Brazilian uh, titles. And uh, they even say that, uh, how can I say, they, they, they try to, how can I say, make a series of uh, in, uh, interview about the uh, international indie game developers. And uh, uh, they, uh, they don't think, uh, how can I say, uh, the, uh, where, they, uh, where they come from, but uh, as they do the, this interview, then they find that, uh, how can I say, how important uh, the Brazilian uh, indie game developers are in, inside the recent, uh, recent uh, environment of the uh, indie, game, uh, indie game scene worldwide. Yeah. So it seems that, uh, how can I say, compared with uh, four or five years ago, uh, the, how can I say, uh, visibility of the Brazilian uh, games uh, is uh, increasing, increasing uh, how can I say, uh, gradually, I think. Uh, also, uh, however, uh, I know that, uh, how can I say, you know the name of the game platformers and uh, publishers in Japan, like the Nintendo or Sony or Square Enix or uh, such companies. But uh, meanwhile, it's v uh, I, I, I dare to say that uh, it's really difficult to work with such big, uh, bigger companies because uh, their overseas business division is uh, very small and uh, their authority is smaller than the, how can I say, uh, the domestic game business division or uh, development division. So for example, if you uh, make a meeting with uh, uh, like the, how can I say, uh, the such a Japanese game company uh, in the GDC or to TGS, to Tokyo Game Show, or uh, game, even in the Gamescom or Bra uh, Brazil Game Show, then maybe you can make a how can I say good 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 people uh, in, in uh, from uh, from them, but uh, and they say that oh yes uh, I can work with you or uh, I can uh, they they say they they speak like, like very friendly, but uh, actually their uh, their authority is very small inside their company, so sometimes how can I say. Uh, they they don't have a how can I say good good power to making a decision inside the company. So that's why uh, after how can I say finishing the conference, then you cannot make a follow up with uh, uh, such companies sometimes. So yeah, uh, it's a kind of difficulty in the working uh, yeah with such companies. I think yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I put the how can I say uh, that uh, meanwhile how can I say the kinds of how can I say Indie game, indie game market uh, re is regarded as a kind of a niche market uh, in the Japanese game game scene, and uh, actually uh, smaller game game publishers uh, work a very good job. And uh, uh, I put the how can I say uh, the Kakashi games uh, on the uh, first of the how can I say example uh, because uh, I'm a friend of Zaxna, but uh, yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I put this because uh, it's very important game publisher because uh, in the Japanese game market, localization is a kind of essential. Uh, and uh, if, if you, how can I say, just uh, publish the game in, uh, in English or in other languages, uh, it, uh, most of the Japanese game, uh, game users don't understand the e English or other languages. So, it's difficult to reach the game users. And uh, actually, Katiyashi games are known as a really great localization. Uh, so, and, uh, so that's why I, 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 I put the Katiyashi games uh, on the first of the, uh, this page. Uh, besides the Katiyashi games, uh, there are a lot of uh, other game publishers like the Plasm. Uh, Plasm is a big, uh, really big uh, game publisher uh, who uh, localize a lot of, uh, how can I say, uh, fam famous titles. And uh, like the also the chorus wide wide or and recently interestingly, uh, a big, a bigger game publishers and uh, distributor also try to work for the indie game division. And uh, I put the example uh, the uh, from uh, Happynet. Uh, Happynet is a kind of the how can I say game distributor in Japan, and uh, they are kind of wholesaler or middleman. But uh, uh, recently they start to make a kind of how can I say indie game division. Uh, and they they want to find uh, in, uh, good into indie games inter, uh, internationally, so I think uh, you you will have a, a better option uh, than ever before. Yeah. 
And uh, if you like, uh, if you like, uh, I have a kind of bigger list of the game publishers who deal with uh, international games in the Japanese game market. Uh, if you like, uh, please, uh, please let me know by email or LinkedIn. And uh, it, yeah, here is the game, uh, game event for the indie game, indie devs. Uh, actually, maybe you know the Tokyo Game Show, but the Tokyo Game Show is too big to, how can I say, uh, visit. Yeah, actually, how can I say? Yeah, and uh, it's it becomes more international than, how can I say, uh, it was, but uh, it's still uh, difficult for international game companies to, how can I say, um, uh, uh, exhibit their games and uh, getting getting feedbacks from the Japanese game users. Actually, if you uh, if you put uh, exhibit your games into the Tokyo Game Show, uh, some people may play, but uh, they they just how can I say uh, make smile and uh, they don't uh, they don't say anything. So then you uh, you cannot get uh, good feedback from them. So yeah, I think uh, how can I say uh, in, uh, and. Uh, yeah, it's also they don't use uh, me too much, so that's why it's very difficult to making uh, how can I say uh, ex increase expanding their con your connection. Uh, so that's why uh, I don't think I, I cannot recommend uh, uh, you to go to the Tokyo Game Show without any plan. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there are some how can I say uh, the uh, uh, there are some how can I say uh, great uh, game event for the indie game developers. Especially, uh, Beat Summit is a really great event. Uh, it, it it is uh, uh, held in the uh, in Kansai region uh, in the western uh, western part of Japan, and uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, Jun, Jun san will uh, talk about that later. And uh, there is, is besides that, uh, there are uh, some uh, indie game uh, event. They are smaller. Uh, they, they they are smaller. Uh, but uh, and uh, some, sometimes they are so domestic, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, they have uh, uh, they they provide you uh, some how can I say good uh, good opportunity uh, to uh, uh, connect with uh, Japanese fans. Uh, also, uh, I, I'd like to say that the uh, Indie Live Expo, uh, it's a kind of a streaming uh, event for the indie game in, in, indie games both inside and outside of Japan uh, is a very good opportunity for you to how can I say. Uh, exhibit your games toward the Japanese game firms, and uh, they uh, they are uh, they are how can I say uh, free uh, advertising space and uh, not non non ad uh, free advertising space so uh, a, a, a advertising corner. So I think uh, how can I say uh, maybe if you if you are interested in uh, if you are indie game de developer and uh, if you are interested in the uh, exhibiting your game into the Japanese game market. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I recommend you to submit your game to the uh, this event. Yeah. So finally, uh, I'd like to how can I say wrap up. Uh, in, uh, so final, uh, first of all, uh, in spite of the uh, uh, it's com a comparatively small PC game market, a Japanese indie game market is expanded rapidly, and uh, it makes a really good nice niche market uh, for international game developers. In addition to that. And uh, great, a uh, greater part of the Japanese fans, developers, publishers, and uh, even media cannot read English. So localization is so important. And uh, you, in order to uh, enter the Japanese market, you need to find a good localizer. Yeah. Uh, so finally, uh, the it's they, uh, although they have a lot of big names uh, uh, of the game publishers and uh, game platformers inside Japan, but uh, uh, it's very difficult to work with, uh, work, uh, work for, uh, work for you, uh, uh, work to, uh, it's very difficult for you to work with, work with them. But uh, uh, it is also true that, uh, how can I say, they try to understand the international indie game scene. So yeah, uh, give, so uh, please give them a chance. And uh, yeah, I also have a good connection with them, so then, if you uh, feel difficulty in work with uh, such companies, uh, please let me know. Yeah, uh, so this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. If you're interested in my slides, then uh, please contact me and let, let, let me know. Then I will send you the slides as well as the publishers list. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, amazing session. Uh, 
uh, you, I really enjoy listening about the, the rise of uh, indie game market here in Japan. And I, I share <laughs> your impressions about the difficulty of working with a big uh, game publisher here. Mm. I'm still trying, since my meeting with Nintendo, I'm still trying to find a way to work with them towards yeah. uh, helping uh, Brazilian game studios. Also, thank you for the introduction for our next two guests. Uh, John, that uh, is one of the organizers for Beat Summit. And, and Zach, that's uh, one of the, the leads at uh, Kakehashi, well, the founder of Kakehashi Games. So uh, uh, it will be great to hear from them. So uh, thank you. Uh, let's move for the next session. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, John Davis to share his experience working with uh, Japanese uh, indie developers. John is a gaming professional with over 10 years of experience in editorial, event management and development. Uh, John works uh, to bridge uh, gaps between Japanese and West uh, as organizer of Beat Summit. It's uh, one of the main, uh, I think the main uh, indie game uh, event here in Japan. Uh, and also as an uh, external consultant, uh, he, uh, the Beat Summit was established in 2012 and it strives to give Japanese independent games a platform to share their creativity and talents uh, with the world. Uh, well, thank you, John, and the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to, to dive right into it. Uh, let me just present here. As uh, Sho said, uh, da, 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 da. and Graham said, I am uh, a member of the Bit Summit organizing committee. Papa, Bit Summit. All in your face. There's gonna be a lot of Bit Summit in this, so please uh, bear with me. Um, uh, yeah, let me give me a brief introduction. I've been in Japan for 19 years now. I came here uh, teaching English uh, and freelancing as a writer at game publications like Famitsu, IGN, uh, Game Labo, Dengeki, things like that. Um, and uh, since uh, moving out of editorial i moved into uh to development uh working with like grasshopper manufacturer with q games and um <clears throat> from there at q games uh we went along with james milky oh you'll see one of these pictures here on the right here uh we we were bored at q and we had just finished a project uh and so we decided let's start an event not knowing that it would be a 10-year journey uh that's some of being in its 10th year this year um, but yeah, it, it was uh, something we felt at the time that uh, the Japanese market kind of needed um, to connect indies in the West who were doing such a good job, job like uh, uh, getting together and trying to bring together this very disparate kind of scene in, in uh, Japan into something a little bit more, um, more uh, cohesive. Um, in addition to Bit Summit, uh, I also worked with the Mega Booth for many years. Um, and my main role there was 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 kind of what I do now, which is uh, trying to help um, indies in Japan get overseas to events like PAX, Gamescom, and whatnot, uh, big as well, um, and and helping um, Western developers, uh, Western indies get into Japan. Um, so that's what we have been. Uh, with this on its main purpose has been for the past ten years. Uh, I want to I want to look at just some brief numbers, um, just so you guys get a kind of idea of the scope of the industry here now um, and the growth. Uh, show I'm sure Show and, and Zach have have you know Show had better numbers and Zach is probably going to have even better numbers. So here's my little my middling uh, data driven analysis of uh, <laughs> of the games market here. Um, as you can see, the pink line here is is the uh, the growth in East Asia, which is include includes Korea, uh, China, and Japan. And uh, and that's one thing that we've seen um, recently. I think a lot of these numbers are a little skewed because of uh, the numbers in China, but um, but the game market here continues to grow uh, as it does worldwide. Um, 20 trillion. I don't know how much 20 trillion is in dollars right now, but but uh, let me see. What is this? It's very, it's a lot. The, the game market continues to grow, and you can see all those percentages here um, that uh, the Asian market continues to be a very important place, uh, despite the, the the kind of the trends that you'll see in worldwide media about games. 
Um, there are lots of consumers here uh, who are eager to for, for new and great content. Um, the Japanese industry uh, is mainly, you can see from this, uh, this chart here, it's kind of hard to read, but the, the line that's grown up here, this, this uh, like blue, bluish green is online games and uh, PC games um, and apps. Uh, and so this is a part of the industry has been growing quite steadily uh, over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, all of this data is from Famitsu uh, Hokusho, uh, this, which is their like yearly uh, industry report. Um, you can see that like in the last uh, couple of years, uh, game centers, arcades um, have have had a, experienced a, a steep fall off um, as part of the market, and a lot of that has to do with uh, with the pandemic. Of course, with people not going out, uh, this data is from 2020, so this is like right at the beginning of, of the pandemic. But this, uh, uh, we expect this trend to continue. I don't think many of you have have games that you'll be trying to port to arcade machines, um, but uh, but you can notice that that the steady trend globally has been for people to move online uh, to enjoy their their gaming entertainment. Um, I wanted to show this just uh, to just kind of give everybody an, uh, a very anecdotal look at like what um, games are selling in Japan. If you'll look at this, I'm sure you'll like kind of see a pattern here with the publisher and the platform. Um, the Switch is continues to be the king in Japan. Uh, this is the same list. You can see that everything here in orange is from the switch uh and uh we have the one one title um on the ps4 which is on fantasy 7 remake so the majority of big publisher uh, games here are are selling on the switch with the ps4 um and or playstation platforms coming in second um you can see the hardware distribution here uh and this is just um from from march of 2021 um, but the Switch has a lion's share of the data of the uh, the users here. Uh, the PS4 uh, with 30%, and last year the PlayStation at at around 2%. And we don't even see the Xbox on here. It's like you need a microwave. It's, it's like 0.1%. It's not not a big market here. So uh, and PC, of course, is not on on this as all because PC data has been so historically difficult to collect. Uh, but just to keep it in your mind, um, um, if you're going to release a game on the platform here, of course, uh, I know a lot of your your lead development skews will be on PC. Uh, but being ready to go to Switch for Asian markets, I mean, worldwide markets really, the Switch is so is so dominating as far as like just the number of units in people's hands. But it's kind of a no-brainer here. Um, the other thing that you should think about with Japan is is the type of games that people are playing here. Um, as you can see in this in this list for the top ten uh, games, um, uh, most of these games are some sort of uh, of RPG or action game. Um, these this genre continues to be super popular in Japan uh, and in Asia, uh, and so being ready uh, or having a game that that you feel like is going to to reach the users in this market a little bit easier uh, is is also going to be something you should consider when you're thinking about uh, publishing in Japan. Is this game going to fit here? Um, and then, you know, I, I would definitely recommend working with uh, other publishers and partners that, that I'll mention later that you should, you should bring your games to Japan, um, uh, but also you should temper your expectations about what kind of users are going to uh, play the game and, and are they going to be the mainstream, you know, hardcore gamers or or just casual gamers or just very, very niche gamers? Um, you can see here as well the, uh, the kind of the breakdown for the titles, um, the action related titles. We only have 17, but RPG related titles have 46. And of course, RPG now can kind of encompass a lot of different things. Um, but but having those kind of elements in your game uh, can help uh, promote it in this region. So what kind of consumers are uh, Japanese game players or gamers? Um, this is a picture from TGS back when, before the pandemic. Looks so, so nice. Never looked at a crowd so lovingly in my life. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, 
Um, the users here are are really active and and savvy. Uh, the, the internet culture is vibrant. Um, Japanese consumers are pretty picky, um, and and have kind of accept, accepted styles and expectations for um, art and, and tropes and stories. Um, I'm sure you guys can see anybody that's watched a lot of anime or played a lot of Japanese games will kind of start seeing the same themes, you know, like one image that you see in a lot of Japanese, like like slice of life school anime is like, you know, somebody late for school in the morning and running with, with a piece of toast in their mouth. Um, and it's like knowing those kind of cultural cl clues that will bring you uh, closer to the audience here. Um, foreign brands especially have like a hard time kind of, of shaking off the, the mantle of being foreign, um, which is uh, kind of just outside of, of normal Japanese um, culture and, and kind of either embracing that and, and knowing um, um, that's where your strength is or trying to localize your content uh, to meet the consumers here and, and be part of the like the inside uh, of the culture is really important. Um, I think that's one of the reasons we've never seen Microsoft really succeed in Japan. So it's dangerous to go alone, take a sword. Uh, there are a few things that you can do to try to get um, some leverage and expand your, your brand in Japan. Um, Traditional media, these are some of the examples. Uh, IGN, Gadget Sushin, Weekly Fimitsu, GameSpark, PlayStation. These are all like still very big monoliths in, in shaping the opinions uh, of the gaming community in Japan. Um, being able to get your game into one of these uh, magazines, um, most of these places, most of these places, I believe, do have, except for probably IGN, all have have uh, uh, physical editions. Maybe Gadget Shushin doesn't. I'm not sure, but most of these these media are, are online, but also they have traditional um, uh, magazines. Famitsu is the only weekly out the game publication in the world, um, and getting your games in these these spaces is really important. Uh, and trying to to crack this market uh, and to do that you'll really need to build a good network uh, it's it's much more involved than just sending a, a press release over to these guys um, you'll need to to either have a good partner here on the ground and a publisher uh, or or be able to to make an impression on editors at uh, some of the events that, that I'll mention later um, yeah, this just kind of goes over some of the stuff I just said. Uh, you know, weekly Famitsu's circulation is uh, five hundred thousand per week, which is which is crazy in this uh, internet age. Uh, a lot of these these brands like Dengeki have different types of magazines to appeal to different types of gamers. Um, you might have uh, your visual novels branded one, or or something that's just for PlayStation or Nintendo. So being able to to Getting us in this space is pretty important. The other thing about Japanese media, and this is a quote from uh, from the editor in chief, uh, he says that Japanese games media, not only Famitsu but others as well, really work closely with publishers and developers. We team up with them and decide when to put out stories and things like that. So it's kind of a partnership. We have the same destiny as game publishers, and we work as a team to make the industry games industry better. That's how we view ourselves. So when speaking with the Japanese media, you should understand that they don't have the kind of uh, relationship that that in the, the the media in the West kind of pretends to have, which is that they're completely uh, opinion free or not opinion free, but completely divorced from uh, the rest of, of of the game process, and they're just there to judge the games critically. Uh, the Japanese media doesn't really view themselves like that. They they feel like they're here to to they sort of function to help uh, the publishers and the game developers, but also the the um, game consumers. And and because of that, it's so important to to have you know not try to have that kind of sterile relationship that you might have with uh, game publications in the West, but understand that like cultivating relationships in Japan um, through 
drinking, through, you know, having dinners, through meeting at events is really important. Uh, so the, the media here can understand that your game is important to show to, to consumers, but also for the industry as well. So the other thing uh, that everyone always talks about is, is uh, these days, content creators, influencers. Um, I, everyone knows about, this is a, a clip from, from, I don't know if some of you might recognize this, but this is from Nico Nico Dolga. Um, I just wanted to illustrate this is just show how different uh, online commentary in Japan kind of developed from the rest of the world. Um, of course, you have Twitch here. Of course, you have YouTube here. Um, but there's also, you know, to my point, a very different kind of um, uh, culture around presenting. Um, uh, and so I wanted to, to show give everybody just just a brief overview of Nico Nico Doga, um, which is probably one of the largest streaming platforms here in, in Japan. Um, you see the rank 14th over you uh, second to YouTube. Um, and most uh, of the big influencers um, will be on this platform in addition to other ones. Um, it's a little bit obtuse to try to get inside Nico Nico Doga. They, they have like really weird business models for, for pain. Uh, being a subscriber and how many minutes you can watch and yada, yada, yada. So it's a little bit hard as a foreign person trying to get into it. Um, but uh, but it's worth it to to look uh, outside of your traditional channels um, like Twitch and YouTube. Um, most, uh, according to the data that, that uh, in 2015, about 90% of Japanese people in their 20s have, have a Nico Nico Doga account. Um, and they don't just have uh, games, they have a lot of like, you know, anime stuff, uh, regular variety program stuff, uh, sports. So it's a platform that you should, if you're talking to a publisher in Japan, uh, which I totally recommend you do if you are serious about, about making a dent into this market, it's one of the options that you should also consider. Uh, there are also like a lots of, uh, I shouldn't say lots of, but a couple of um, smaller uh, more niche areas um, where you can reach fans in Japan. Uh, Ni Channel and Go Channel are, are, are two channel and, and five channel are completely anonymous uh, and very very dangerous place to to kind of wander into. <laughs> but uh, if you have local people on the ground that can help you, then these bulletin boards, these forums, are a good place to to try to to connect with like niche users. Um, just be aware that some of them are very you know, not safe for work. Um, another another way to kind of uh, weasel your way into to the Japanese gaming zeitgeist is through uh, collaborations with other uh, events or I'm mean, sorry other developers. Um, uh, Cappy brought its uh, sword and sorcery, and they had uh, the VO for the game uh, done by Suda Fifty One, uh, and then they did a remake soundtrack with uh, with uh, Bion from Q Games, um, Akira Yamaoka from the Silent Hero series and Michiru Yamane from Castlevania series. So um, having that kind of connection gives gives your game an angle into into Japan, but also for um, for the uh, the consumer to know. Streets of Rage did something similar with Yuzo Koshiro doing a lot of the music for, for that title. So let me talk about BitSummit. Uh, we, we started BitSummit, like I said, 10 years ago um, with the idea of trying to connecting indies uh, in Japan and in the West. Um, and when we first started, we were about, I think we had about 200 people. Uh, these are some of the pictures from recent shows. And la the last pre-pandemic event we had, I believe we had about 15,000 people come. So it's a big, a big uh, jump up. And the, the, the event has been, uh, has grown steadily since then. So. Um, we do have, uh, we're accepting applications for Bit Summit right now uh, for the show in August. This will be our first show that we'll have the public at uh, in two years. So we're really excited about that. Um, and what we found is that after doing the show last year and it only being a B2B show, um, we discovered that, that a lot of the developers and publishers and platform holders actually wanted that kind of just B2B space instead of uh, uh, usually some of this two days with the public. 
Um, this year, where we split it up so that we have a one one day just for for networking, and we have one day for the public, um, and then we have our media influencers uh, in essence, and essence social media platforms that will be promoting the event over those two days. Um, like I said, being able to connect people with people in person is like so important uh, in, in Japanese business culture and we found that that the connections that people are making at Bit Summit have led to a lot of like positive um, uh, businesses and working relationships between between developers, publishers, platform holders, etc. Like it's just it's so important to be able to go to an event about the size of Bit Summit where you only have a few hundred presenters, uh, exhibitors there, and and there's nowhere to go in Kyoto. I mean, it's a very small city, so it's not like Tokyo Game Show where everybody's all over the place. Everybody's usually very packed in 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 a good way uh, around one area, and and you just get a, a good chance to actually talk to people in a more relaxed environment. Um, and that's it's so important when trying to to make inroads into content creators and media here. Uh, we also have awards. Um, I mean, the bits on this is a lot like a, a lot of the shows. I would say that the scale of it is 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 probably um, one of our our best assets um, when compared to a show like TGS or PAX or something like that. Um, what we try to do for the developers who attend is we we provide them um, with uh, exhibiting space, a table, chairs. Um, we give all the developers a PC and monitor because we know developers coming from overseas have a lot of um, trouble bringing over equipment. Uh, and we offer volunteer uh, translation support uh, for people from overseas. So we'll have usually about a team of about 30 to 50 different uh, interpreters that are kind of wandering the, flow, the, the show floor and helping to facilitate communication uh, between the developers and the uh, uh, the public. Uh, so, uh, as I said before, we're accepting applications for BitSummit right now. If anybody is interested in in um, applying to this year's show, uh, I definitely recommend you do. Um, I'd be happy to to pass out some uh, some codes for you guys to to uh, register for free if anybody is uh, is interested. Um, it's not free exhibition fee. It's just free for the for the uh, system to register, that's it. Uh, but anyway, but every 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 dollar counts uh, in in game development. Um, so yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer after the show. Uh, there are a couple of other events um, that are not on the radar. Um, show introduced some uh, like that that he showed before, like uh, like um, uh, Tokyo Sandbox, which is this weekend. These are um, some other events. Comic Cat uh, is is a fan con, and it's more about doujin culture uh, and independent like amateur culture in Japan. But um, but there are lots of game things that are going on there as well. So that's something you can look to. Uh, Nico Nico Chokaigi is the other is the annual like a uh, Nico Nico uh, event. Um, like I said, they're just like they're they're show i mean their their website they cover all types of things uh and tokaigi which is more game focused and esports focused is their other event um also has a lot of uh, uh indie representation and game representation so these are our other um events that you should consider when thinking about getting into japan and yeah, uh, I just want to, to uh, Zach is about to come on next, and I think that he'll probably elaborate on this more than anything, but uh, I want to stress that it's very important to, to have a good partner here uh, when trying to, to, uh, to break into Japan. Um, just just putting your information out on the internet is, is uh, as a start, it's the first step. After that, you'll need, you'll need to do the legwork and you know, start shaking hands, kissing babies. Uh, in order to to really uh, spread your word about about your products, so yeah, that's it. Uh, happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Thank you, John. Another great presentation. Uh, I really said when you mentioned the the decline of the arcade industry in Japan, we were all sad to see 
Ikebukuro's in Akihabara Sega store closing, so yeah yeah it's big yeah it's kind of crazy to see these these uh these places that are are disappearing now so i'm glad i was here for some of it so hopefully <laughs> they can uh be, turn around and, and maybe turn some of their past glory with the end of the pandemic also thank you for the great tips for the brazilian developers and uh for the especially for the pitch uh, for for bits i'm really hoping that the more brazilian developers uh, go to Kyoto and, and, and join this event. So thank you. Thank you. So, finally, I would like to invite uh, Zach Huntley to share his uh, vast experience in helping overseas companies bring their games to Japan, including some Brazilian games. Uh, Zach has over 20 years of experience in game industry, working uh, for and with Nintendo, Sega, Unity, Secret Level, Lucas Arts, uh, Cyber Combat, Ubisoft, Capcom, and many other companies. Uh, in roles ranging from game uh, design, production, and business development and PR. He's a business manager and founder of Kakehashi Games. I've uh, already mentioned plenty of times here today, a company that provides publishing support for video game companies abroad. They want to release their games in Japan. Uh, from to date, Zach and his team has helped uh, launch uh, just under 300 games in Japan and nearly, nearly 200 of these games in Nintendo Switch. So uh, welcome, Zach. The floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, thanks to uh, Sato-san for that shout out a uh, half hour ago or so. Uh, definitely appreciate it. Um, I guess since Guillermo kind of just uh, gave that uh, nice introduction, I really don't need to uh, say much more. And we can just kind of dive right into this presentation now. Let me pull this up. All right, is everybody able to see this? Looks like it's presenting now. All right, so uh, first off, um, obviously we're gonna be talking today, my uh, presentation's all about how to release your game in Japan. Um, the good news is that it's never been easier for a foreign company to release a video game in the Japanese market. You don't need to be a Japanese business. You don't need a Japanese address. You don't need a Japanese bank account. You don't need a Japanese age rating. You don't need a Japanese publisher. You don't even need to speak, read, or write Japanese, right? Um, all you really need is a lot of patience um, and an understanding that things work a little differently in the Japanese market. Um, now on the downside is that it's never been harder for a Western indie game uh, to succeed in the Japanese market. Uh, Western games are definitely a very niche market in Japan. And uh, most Japanese gamers strongly prefer Japanese made games. So there just isn't as much of an appetite for Western games. Um, I think this is something that kind of Sato-san mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, but on top of that, indie games are even more niche. Um, you know, things are definitely trending in a positive direction. And we're seeing things like, you know, Steam users is growing dramatically in the last few years and events like BitSummit, you know, we're seeing much, much more pers participation um, in these. Um, but still, when you compare it to other markets, um, you will find that Japanese consumers are just, uh, I would say, skeptical a little bit of indie games. Um, so while it's trending in a positive direction, it's still not like other territories. So as a Western indie game developer, you're kind of a niche of a niche market. So it makes things very difficult. Uh, beyond that, uh, visibility um, in Japan is obviously very difficult. I'm sure any of you who've released a game, that's obviously the number one concern anywhere in the world. Um, but I think what makes things especially difficult in Japan is that platform holders here are going to be more interested if they're going to promote indie games, they're going to want to promote Japanese made indie titles. Um, and then, of course, there's all these you know, huge number of Japanese published games, AAA games. Um, so as a, you know, a Western indie developer, you're, you're fighting for a very, very, you know, kind of small share of any kind of potential visibility, you know, options. So it's, uh, unless your game is kind of game of the year kind of quality, it gets uh, very hard to expect any kind of featuring at launch. Uh, beyond that, uh, marketing is uh, an incredible challenge in this market. Um, the game media, and I think this is something that uh, John kind of brought up that uh, really segues nicely here, is that the game media, they really only actually want to work with the publisher developer of a game. Uh, they view that as kind of an integral relationship. And because of that, you actually don't see many PR agencies for hire. Um, so 
in this market, a lot of the marketing is just done by publishers. Um, so you can't just kind of expect to hire a PR agency, you know, a couple months before release and then expect a bunch of great coverage at launch. Um, it's just not the way things uh, work in the Japanese market. Um, but while it is hard to have success here, it's definitely not impossible. Um, and we've had numerous success stories over the last five to six years. It's just, again, I think this was brought up in other presentations too. You just really need to temper your expectations. Um, so just in, as far as actual steps um, to start uh, releasing your game, obviously number one is localization. Um, nothing can kill your chances for success in Japan faster than a poor loc. And it's really hard to recover from a poor loc once the game is already released, right? Um, so some general tips. Um, you really need to give your localizer plenty of time, reference materials, notes, debug commands, et cetera. Um, if you give your localizer just you know, a spreadsheet without much information, your localization is not going to be very good. Um, make sure your, your localizer is a native Japanese speaker. Um, this seems really obvious, but I've actually seen there's other Japanese you know, localization providers out there where they actually use non-native speakers. Um, it's, you know, I've also seen indie developers, you know, maybe they have a friend or a family member who's, you know, studied Japanese for a long time. Um, I've lived in Japan now for, you know, over 10 years. I've been involved in the localization industry for, you know, quite a while now. I would never in a million years consider trying to localize something myself from English into Japanese. Um, and you need, really need to make sure that your localizer is native. Um, one bit of advice is try to get some temporary just placeholder Japanese text into your game and start testing your Japanese fonts in advance as soon as possible. Um, there's just so many unique aspects of the Japanese language, one of which being that there's no spaces between words, um, and that can just wreak havoc on, you know, line wrapping and, you know, kind of breaking between lines. Um, and just in terms of, you know, there's just so many different things. Um, Obviously, it's a completely different style of font, having thousands and thousands of characters. Um, so the sooner that you can get just some placeholder text in your game and start working through any of the uh, problems, the better. Um, make sure that the localizer has a good contact with the dev team so they can ask questions about the context of the strings. Um, Japanese and English do not translate directly very well between one another. And a Japanese localizer typically needs to kind of almost rewrite the text completely um, from English into Japanese to make sure it makes sense. So they really need to understand the, the meaning behind every string of the game. Um, and once the first translation is done, understand that that's kind of not the end of the process. Um, and you need to give your localizer a build with the Japanese text implemented so they can perform edits, they can look for bugs, and just make sure everything is looking good. Um, at Kakihashi Games, we kind of consider the first pass translation to only be about 50 to 60% of the total work, and the rest of it is actually iterating um, once that translation's been implemented to make sure that it's actually displayed in a manner that uh, you know, it's kind of understood for the, for the Japanese market. Um, also, you really need to understand that there's going to be a lot of bugs on the programming side, um, and you don't assume that the localizers can fix everything just by simply adjusting their translation. Um, obviously, a lot of developers will say, well, just make the translation shorter, right? Or just make it work. Um, there's some certain things that you can't, um, and you will almost certainly need to be able to kind of uh, make some changes to your systems, uh, adapt some things, fix some bugs that are gonna be very specific to Japanese, because the localizer can only do so much. Um, and it's just really important to note that having a great Japanese localization requires a collaborative effort from the developer and the localizer. You could hire the best Japanese localizer in the industry and pay them a ton of money, um, but if you don't provide them with the resources and materials that they need, then the localization will definitely not be um, of the standard that you would want. So step two, submission. Uh, fortunately, things are way easier these days, and there really aren't any special steps to get your game through submission uh, to release in Japan. Um, if you're an approved developer, then you can automatically release in Japan as well. Um, so if it's Nintendo, Sony, you know, Microsoft, whatever, um, before they used to kind of separate things up by territory, but now if you're approved for one, you're approved for all. So if you can release in North American Europe, 
then Japan is typically just you know kind of ticking a box to say that you want to release there as well. Um, this is a new change, but now uh, a local age rating, uh, CERO, is no longer required for digital only releases. Um, so you can actually just release um, with an IARC rating now on Switch, you know, PlayStation, uh, Xbox, and of course, PC platforms don't require a rating at all. Uh, the one note is that if your game is mature rated, um, or if you're releasing a physical version, then a CERO rating is still required, even if it's digital only. Um, so also all consoles now have like unified submission systems that are all in English. Uh, so there's no need to worry about communicating in Japanese at all. Um, and this is not really directly related to submission, but you know, kind of semi-related. Um, it's just when setting up your game, make sure that it detects the user system setting and defaults to the correct language. Um, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of time, money, and effort to make sure you have a great localization. But then when a Japanese user first launches the game, you know, it shows up in English. And then they have to manually change their settings to get it into Japanese. Um, seems like a simple thing, but a lot of people, even big publishers, sometimes make this mistake. Uh, so it's definitely something to be very careful about. Um, but the big note here is that as long as your game can clear submission for the other territories, you really shouldn't need to worry about anything specific for Japan. Uh, step three is uh, metadata. Now, uh, a lot of people might think it's kind of strange to talk specifically about metadata, but in my opinion, it's actually an area where most developers and publishers make their biggest mistakes. Some general tips. Um, first off, make sure all of your assets for your metadata are localized. Um, your store page, your screenshots, your trailer you know, on your store page, make sure everything is in Japanese. Um, the last thing that people see before buying your game is your store page, and you don't want to give them any excuse to change their mind. Um, so this is something that is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, you know, if, if you're having a, a store in the real world and you're trying to sell product, you'd want to make sure that you know, you're kind of setting things up well so the people who are coming to your store want to buy your, buy your products that you're, that you're selling. Um, pricing is very important. Uh, don't just use the latest like actual financial conversion rates between you know, US dollars and, and Japanese yen. Um, and if all else fails, just go with Steam's automatic conversion. Uh, they do a lot of research. You know, Valve knows what they're doing. Um, and I think that uh, there's a lot of data behind how they do their automatic conversions. Um, but uh, a simple rule of thumb, um, even if you don't follow Steam, is just use one US cent to one Japanese yen. So if it's 20 US dollars, you're looking at 2,000 yen. Um, as long as you're sticking in that general kind of price range, uh, you'll be in good shape. Um, and again, with the metadata, make sure you're making use of any opportunity for visibility. Uh, do a pre-order, do a coming soon page, do a launch discount. If there's something you know, within the metadata that will allow you uh, to get your game on some other element of the storefront, um, you know, make use of it because uh, it's going to be the, your biggest chance to, to get your game in front of more people. Um, <clears throat> and then one note is that everything can be done in English, but um, the Japanese store teams for both Nintendo and Sony, um, they do have some slightly different procedures and requirements. I can't really talk about what those are just, you know, due to NDA, but uh, just be aware that there are going to be, you know, some unique things, maybe your screenshots need to be a different size, or when you're creating your, your trailer, um, maybe there's some very specific rules. So don't kind of get in this sense of, OK, everything's the same. Um, a lot of it is, but there's going to be a few little things that you need to be aware of. Um, and another important thing is, even if you can do everything in English, uh, don't expect to be able to bend the rules or ask for special favors. Um, this is something that I see a lot of people kind of make mistakes with. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, the America store team allows me to submit my metadata one week before, but you're asking me to do it two weeks before. Can you let me do it later? Uh, no, they won't. Um, procedures and rules are there for a reason. And in Japan, it's very uh, uncommon to people to try to negotiate, you know, procedures and policies um, and rules. Um, so, you know, whatever the rules are, don't question them. You know, you definitely just need to follow them and don't uh, complain that uh, you know, the rules are different in Japan than in other territories. 
Um, and I think, uh, again, the note here is that it doesn't matter if you have great in-game localization. Um, if your store page is poorly localized, people will assume your game is as well, right? So treat it with the respect it deserves. Uh, kind of the last big step in releasing your game is marketing. Um, and this will definitely be the single biggest challenge you're going to face in the Japanese market. Um, so again, as I said before, PR agencies are uncommon and most marketing is handled by local publishers. Um, so again, not going to really be able to just hire a PR agency and expect that they're going to take care of everything like they do in the West. Um, and this is while well, you don't need a publisher, as I stated kind of earlier, this is where they actually are, you know, obviously very beneficial, right? Um, you, if you want to do much um, with uh, the Japanese media, then obviously having a local partner is absolutely critical. Um, but assuming you don't have a local publisher, um, some things you can do by yourself. Um, obviously, attending events is the best way to make contacts. Bit Summit, which is probably my single favorite show in the world, uh, Tokyo Game Show, Tokyo Sandbox, um, being able to actually talk directly with Japanese media and influencers um, is incredibly important. Um, one of the reasons why is that media and influencers will rarely accept free keys from someone that they don't know. Um, this is a cultural aspect in Japan of gift giving. Um, you know, when you receive a gift, you're kind of expected to return the favor um, at some point. And uh, Japanese people feel very uncomfortable about receiving something for free from someone that they don't know. So if you've been able to meet people at events, then that just gives you that opportunity to potentially share keys with people, you know, get more people, you know, kind of uh, streaming or covering your game. Again, about uh, streaming, uh, most emails you get in English from people claiming to be a, a famous Japanese streamer will definitely be a scam. Uh, this happens all the time. I get so many emails from my clients saying, you know, should I give this person a key? And the answer is always no. Um, again, this is part of that gift giving culture. Uh, Japanese people, as much as they don't want to receive a gift from somebody they don't know, they're also not going to ask for a gift from somebody that they don't know. Right. Um, so if you if you get an email from a you know, supposed j famous Japanese streamer, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, another thing is that most media and influencers, they're not going to play your game in advance. Um, and generally, you're not going to have reviews right at launch. Um, and also scored reviews are very rare. Um, so you can't rely on, you know, assuming that you're going to get a high score or that you're going to have a bunch of reviews at launch. Uh, this is a very different aspect um, of how things work here. And we see, you know, reviews and coverage happening, you know, two to three months after release, if not sometimes up to a year after release. Um, it's just things, you know, again, they just work uh, quite a bit differently. And if you wanted a review at launch, you would have had to have been working with the media outlet say you know six months in advance in order to have something like that happen um, so it's very very difficult to uh to coordinate something like that and then scored reviews um you know there's only a very few outlets that will actually do those um, and that's not really how uh, japanese consumers tend to decide what they want to play um, so that's really not something again that you need to rely on very much um, if you do want to do any paid marketing, I would actually recommend Twitter and YouTube as the best and easiest options. Um, again, like, you know, John brought up things like, you know, Nico Nico and stuff like that. Um, and I'm sure there's obviously there's other Japanese, um, you know, options for marketing that might have higher chance for return. Um, but the time and effort and difficulty in dealing with those platforms would probably offset, um, you know, any kind of gains that you're going to get to where something like Twitter and YouTube, uh, they're both huge in Japan. I mean, they're just part of the daily life. And as a, as a foreign company, it's much easier uh, to do any kind of paid marketing campaigns through those platforms um, just directly in English. Um, some other things you can do, you know, have your localizer translate some tweets into Japanese that you can use at launch. You know, just add those into your localization file. Um, and then you can just easily, you know, tweet those out. It's not going to cost you much, um, and it's just an easy way to get more visibility. And also, encourage your localizer to tweet about the game and mention their involvement. Uh, most localizers have you know, their own little kind of small fan bases that have built up due to the games that they've translated, and they're usually very, very happy 
uh, to talk about you know what they've worked on and they're very proud you know of their work and to represent themselves um, so again it's just a very easy simple way to uh to kind of get more visibility for your game in social media um but again you know if your if your game and your store page are well localized people will find it and word of mouth carries a lot of weight in japan uh, you don't necessarily need a big marketing budget here to succeed so just some final thoughts um, you know despite the challenges of succeeding in japan we've seen games sell hundreds of thousands of units in japan uh, like salt and sanctuary um, and sometimes even millions like fall guys um, i think one interesting note is that uh, you know maybe john was mentioning before about how japanese players like rpgs um, and kind of what they generally play um, i think as an indie developer you need to kind of understand that Japanese gamers don't necessarily want a Western version of a Japanese game, though. Um, you know, if they want a bullet hell shooter or a JRPG, they have so many options, right? Um, and if, they, if they're buying an indie game, I feel like they want something really original and unique. They want something that, you know, the, these big Japanese companies aren't making, right? They want something that's uh, very different. Um, be careful about over-localizing your game. Uh, this is actually a pretty common problem. And you'll actually see that most games developed in Japan use a fair bit of English. Um, and trying to localize everything can actually have a negative impact. Um, so if your localizer leaves certain strings in English, it's actually probably on purpose and not a mistake. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, consult with them about it because there is definitely points where having English is actually preferred for in very specific uh, instances. Um, also, don't worry about trying to localize the actual game content or assets. Um, you know, no matter how hard you try, people will be able to tell that it isn't Japanese. So don't try to make your characters, you know, look more anime style, or don't try to, you know, change your story of your game to make it think that it might appeal more to, you know, to Japanese players. Um, you know, unless you actually have, you know, native Japanese people working on your your product, uh, it's just probably going to have a negative impact more than anything else. Um, sim shipping here is very, very important. And the longer you wait to release in Japan, the lower your expected sales will be. Um, I don't want to give anybody the kind of idea of, you know, rushing their game because that's obviously not going to help. Um, you want to make sure that your game is in great condition and well localized. But um, we've just, you know, anecdotally looking through all the games that we've released, if your game is kind of coming out in Japan, say more than three months to six months after the initial, you know, English launch, uh, the sales expectations just kind of fall off a cliff. Um, so you really need to make sure that if you want to release in Japan, you really need to plan in advance and try to make sure that uh, you know you're you're coordinating things to where your Japanese launch is hopefully going to become very shortly, um, or you know, preferably at the same time as your main release. Um, but finally, um, just kind of leave you on the last note here, is that even some games that are hugely famous in the West can really struggle to find success in Japan. But we've actually seen some games perform better here than the rest of the world. Um, the best advice I can really give is just kind of stay true to yourself, make what you want without compromise. Um, because if you make a great game, uh, then that's what Japanese people are going to, you know, kind of remember. And it's not about, uh, you know, anything else. So just make what you want to make, uh, do the best you can. And if you succeed in Japan, it's kind of like that extra icing on the cake. It's that cherry on top. Um, but don't kind of come into it thinking, I must succeed in Japan. Otherwise, I'm, you know, there's this big failure. Um, kind of treat it as an extra thing. And, uh, you know, hopefully you can have a, kind of a good experience with releasing your game here. And that's it. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Like amazing, amazing presentation. Uh, actually, it, it seemed to me almost like one of those uh, walkthroughs I have for my games when I have to read step by step what I should do. So it is a great guidebook for all, all Brazilian developers that join us today on how they should proceed to come to, to Japan. Uh, I've had some questions myself, but uh, you've addressed most of these points. So maybe I'd like to move on for the Q&A and uh, invite our, our participants to ask questions. Uh, I'd like them to actually unmute and uh, open the video uh, to, to, answer, to ask the question themselves, have this direct connection with our speakers. 
Uh, maybe let's start with the gentleman that asked the first question. Let me find it just a second. Other, other ones that like to ask questions, please uh, just raise your hands through the platform, please. Uh, so Juno uh, Cecilio, if you'd like to join us. No, uh, so maybe let's move to the next question. Danielle, yeah, uh, oh, so sorry. maybe maybe I can read for Juno. Uh, Juno has a small baby sleeping, so oh. <laughs> maybe I can ask. <laughs> sorry, sorry, please. So uh, this is for uh, Shol Satu-san. Uh, how would they consider the ideal way to approach the authorities for these large companies? Mm -hmm. Was I regarding see. your point previously. I see. Uh, so you mean that the how can you say how to work with the uh, uh, big uh, bigger game publishers and platformers uh, uh, from uh, uh, international game developers point of view, right? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, how can I say? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of yeah, quite uh, always quite difficult to how can I say uh, work with uh, how can I say uh, bigger game companies uh, and uh, how can I say it's difficult to uh, how can I say find the connection with uh, uh, how can I say bigger uh, how can I say uh, the executives in the such a co uh, companies actually, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's an uh, easier way uh, for you to how can I say uh connect to is to find the person yeah, who has a connection with uh, such executives so yeah uh that's why uh, that's why i'm here uh, that's uh, this is the uh, one of the reasons why i'm here so <laughs> that's why yeah, because uh, how can i say i'm making a, a report for ten, uh, five or six years and then uh, making a uh, sell, selling the such a report to the executives of the such a how can i say uh game companies so uh, i can be a, a part of a help i yeah i i, I don't know uh, i i i i cannot uh, make a 100 percent promise but uh, actually it's important to if uh, how can i say uh broaden your uh kind of a uh, connection inside the japanese uh japanese game market uh, japanese uh game industry and uh, like uh, how can i say making a connection with a friend of the executives like the game journalists or the game researchers or the uh, like the how can I say game uh, advertisers or or for example like the game, uh, yeah yeah kind of, kind of like that so uh, it, it, does it answer uh, your question I don't know well uh, since you cannot uh, unmute uh, mm -hmm. we will assume that uh, it answers her question thank you very much so okay uh let's move on for the next question to the next question sorry daniel caldas could you join us to ask your question thank you yeah of course can, can you guys hear me yes very well thanks so much all right I, first of all i would like to thank you all the presenters for the amazing presentations i actually have a, a very quick question regarding you know types of games that are more interesting for the japanese market uh i think the last presentation uh, it was said that, you know, the Japanese market is looking for, uh, you know, we should not, we shouldn't try to kind of appeal to the Japanese market. So if I want to make like, for example, an RPG game, um, I should try to create like my own identity and not try to translate it for like an anime characters and, and you know, stuff like that. So my question is, um, how, how do I evaluate that? I mean, like, how, how can I know what is a game that would be appealing to the Japanese market without looking Japanese, uh, and, you know, like Japanese style uh, uh, visuals and all that? Um, and are there any examples of successful games that you guys could present so that I can use as reference? Thank you so much. Uh, if I may add to that question, uh, a bit of a... Uh counterintuitive maybe or, or or going against that the, the direction is you can see the the success of Genshin impact here in Japan and it actually right. follows all the Japanese tropes and all this Japanese style so it's uh, maybe some games can 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 make that <laughs> can make mm -hmm. that uh, the bets but not all uh, so 
I'd like to, to hear from you. Uh, can, who can pick up this question? Maybe uh, John or Zach? Well, I would say about, about I was going to say Genshin as well, but Genshin looks like I didn't know it was a, it was a Chinese developed game right. for a long time. Uh, that's mostly probably because I'm not really in, and that's not the type of game I'd play very much. But but um, but yeah, they do a very good job of like they nail everything. If you nail it all, then you're good, you know. But that's really really hard. I think they did tons of research. I see when I talk to to Japanese gamers, sometimes they say, ah, uh, you know, it's like a Korean game that's trying to be Japanese, or a Chinese game is trying to be Japanese. They'll know when you're trying to do it. So the the best thing I think is, is is as Zach said to like embrace your own style. Of course, like look at different elements that of what's popular, you know, for RPGs or whatnot, or or action games, and and take clues from that. But but uh, but if if you're just like I'm going to, you can't ape it. You can't you can't just copy it. They'll they'll know, man. They'll know. <laughs> it's so fast. <laughs> and. I just to hop in real quick, I guess, you know, when people talk about Genshin, right, um, as a Western indie developer, you don't have hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Um, so with Genshin, like, you just look at their voiceover cast that they use, and they've clearly spent millions of dollars just right there, right? So I think it's just when uh, the advice I was giving is kind of more like as a Western indie developer, um, you know, because you just don't have that time and money uh, to be able to, you know, do kind of nail it, you know, as you kind of really need to, right? Um, so I think it just takes, you know, there's not like a specific game that you can look at and say, okay, they did it right, or, you know, as an indie. I think it's just, it's a very long process. Um, and you need to come to Japan, you need to come to events, you need to, you know, see how things work, you know, look at what people are playing, look at what people like. Uh, look at what you know indie games are getting kind of more coverage and success here and just you really have to factor all of that in together yeah, thank, thank you so much here, don't look hollow knight salt sanctuary yeah uh, um yeah those games uh, shovel knight they don't they don't undertale they don't really specifically look like any japanese games i see thank you so much Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we had another question from someone from the audience, but I'm I, uh, Kayaku. Uh, are you still going to ask a question, or did this last one answer your your, your doubts, your questions? Anyone else would like to ask a question? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I, I will make a quick question that I had it be, before. Uh, so, what are the main pitfalls you see foreign developers that want to come to Japan uh, make? Uh, so, uh, apart from trying to adapt the the, the, the games to the Japanese style, uh, I, 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 as you've mentioned, you've mentioned many success stories of some indie games come to Japan, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there are like a cemetery of <laughs> unhappy stories of people trying to come and uh, maybe investing millions in something or other and not not being successful so if you if you know have any any tips any suggestions about what things to avoid uh, it would be great to, to share thank you oh i guess was that for me here well, uh, if you could start, be great. Oh, sure. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I uh, tried to kind of mention some of this in my uh, in my presentation. But, uh, you know, some of the biggest mistakes I see is that, uh, you know, people treat Japan um, as if they're going to treat it just any other territory in the world. Um, and it's just something that requires so much more time and effort uh, than anywhere else. Uh, just there's so many, you know, unique aspects. You know, the localization is going to take way longer. Um, you know, the, the challenges that you're going to have, you know, marketing your product, everything like that. I think the biggest thing that, you know, the mistake is just people assume that it's going to be, you know, kind of just like, you know, releasing in Europe or something. And it's just not. Um, it is its own kind of beast and you do have to really, really plan in advance. Um, but just, yeah, I guess more specific is just, again, what I was saying about the metadata. I see so many people, their store page is just in English. 
um, or their store page, like they Google translated it or something. Um, and that's going to be the quickest turnoff to a Japanese gamer. Again, it's like the last thing they see is your store page. Um, if your store page is bad, everything's bad. You're not going to be able to overcome that. So um, you really need to understand how to present yourself correctly you know, to, to the Japanese consumers. John, Zach, uh, Shaw, would you like to add something to, to, to this answer? Yeah, well, uh, I really agree with the uh, how can you say the, the Zach's opinion. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, for example, you, uh, you, when you uh, check the how can I say the App Store or the Google Play uh, in Japan, and uh, they say that the uh, mm, game is good, but uh, uh, I put the st uh, one star because of the it's it, it doesn't make a, a look a, a, a translation or su such like that. So yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, I can really uh, agree with that. So localization is a kind of uh, key factor. And yeah, uh, at, 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 at least uh, how can I say? Yeah, you, you need to translate the, yeah, yeah, metadata. I mean the, yeah, kinds of like the stoppage, right? And uh, such things. Yeah, yeah, I actually agree with that. And uh, in addition to that, uh, yeah, I also uh, want to say that uh, how can I say? Uh, I, I said before uh, in my presentation that uh, how can I say? Many many international game developers visited the uh, big big game event. Uh, I mean the Tokyo Game Show. <laughs> I, I mean the yeah, and uh, they they hope that uh, uh, if you if you go to the such uh, such an uh, event and then they can find uh, tons of the connection or such like that. But uh, actually, they do not have a, a great great connection, great great matching system. So yeah, so that's why. I, I so that's why I uh, when the how to say time of the uh, Tokyo Game Show coming, uh, many international game developers uh, contact contact me a lot and then uh, hey uh, please connect the uh, game journalists or hey please connect the game media or the game publishers or like that. So I, I needed to uh, I I'm not the how can I say uh, or how can I say work, work, well, I, I don't work for the the Tokyo Game Show, but uh, uh, I, I couldn't help uh, 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 working for them. So <laughs> yeah yeah some. Sometimes such things, uh, yeah, happen. So I think so. Yeah. So you, yeah. Before, yeah, it's it's very important to uh, attend the event. But uh, before you attend the event, you need to prepare prepare for the prepare for a lot. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and uh, actually, uh, yeah, maybe uh, Johnson has a, a better how can I say f better feedback about that. So right. No, yeah, you guys are you're all there, all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you go to TGS and you expect to make a lot of connections with people just being in the indie games area, yeah, people, people, people won't even come over and play a game if you stand there. You gotta be, gotta be so like, hey, do you want to please try my game? <laughs> and like, kind of guilt guilt them into playing your game. I literally like, stand in front of people with flyers like, you need to play. Yeah, it's very, very hard to get to break into that. And and with media, it can be hard as well. So, yeah, yeah. I think and that's, actually, that's uh, right. so, sorry. And uh, actually, uh, and the uh, indie game corner in the Tokyo Game Show is uh, very small. And uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, in the another floor of the bigger area. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's why, yeah. So, the, how can I say? It's important to understand the uh, indie game events like the Beat Summit. I think, yeah. <laughs> right. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Rodrigo, would you like to to answer, ask your question directly? Oh, okay. So. Uh, Rodrigo would like to ask about uh, VR indie titles in Japan, uh, if they are the, the niche of the niche of the niche, <laughs> uh, if there's any good uh, addressable market for it in Japan, uh, which platforms to release, if you could talk about, about a bit about uh, VR games here, it'd be great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it just got working out. 
<laughs> Thanks, Guilherme. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just yeah, you, you made my question. So if there's is if your indie titles now in Japan are uh the niche of a the niche of the niche, Western indie VR. Um and and what you guys see is when what you're seeing actually in the whole Japanese territory, which is the best platform or what the players are looking into, PlayStation or going to standalones or other kind of, of VR headsets and so on. <laughs> Does anybody have any data for that? <laughs> I was gonna, I'm looking at Sato-san and that's, he's yeah. gonna have some data. <laughs> Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It is true that uh, how do you say? I, I, I was uh, work. I worked for the research institute, but uh, actually, I, I think yeah, it is really true that uh, how do you say? VR game market in Japan is a uh, yeah. It is true that the niche of niche of niche, and uh, yeah, yeah. It is true that the, how do you say? Uh, the sales number of the uh, PlayStation VR is. Not so bad. I I had the data, but uh, mm, but actually, for example, you cannot get the how can I say bigger number uh, than the how can I say uh, like the in other countries. I think. Uh, how how about you, uh, John San? Do, do you have uh, some uh, other data about the uh, where you market in Japan? No, I don't have any data. But just like kind of like I said, anecdotally, for the submissions that we get for Bit Summit. Mm -hmm. um, we typically have between 100 to 300 submissions. Things have been kind of up and down because of the pandemic. But when we would have like, you know, 300 submissions, we we maybe have like five VR games mm -hmm. out of all of those, maybe. Like not that not that much. And everybody was using, of course, their lead, their lead SKU is, is uh, Oculus because it's a, it's a little bit easier to get your to develop for as an indie developer. So everything was under that platform. I've actually never seen a PSVR outside of a, a game show here. So but then I guess I have no data. I don't know, maybe I don't hang with the VR people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't really have uh, any you know hard numbers either. Um, but just you know we've helped release um, some VR titles in Japan. Um, and just what I see is um, it's just the VR market so like fractured and so segmented. Um, you know, you have you know people are playing like PSVR, which I think there's a lot of people who own the hardware, but people aren't really buying software right now. Um, I think people, you know, Japanese gamers clearly want to embrace VR. Like when you go to Bit Summit, if there is a VR game, like it has the biggest lines out of any, you know, game, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's definitely been games that people want to play it. Um, but I think, you know, especially in Japan, people's homes are so small generally that they don't have the space uh, to play VR. Um, and that has a major impact. Also, a lot of Japanese uh, gamers don't necessarily have PCs. Um, it is such a console focused market um, and that's why psvr kind of has been more successful um, i would say psvr 2 you know clearly um, if you can get a launch on that um, you know sony will be putting a lot of marketing effort behind it you know that's going to be an area where you could definitely succeed um, i'd say japanese people are slowly you know kind of picking up on the quest uh, just because it is a bit easier you know to kind of set up um, but overall, I think, yeah, niche of niche of niche of niche of niche of niche. Like it's it's a very difficult market. And also be aware that Japanese people generally have um, a sensitivity to motion sickness. And a lot of people actually will take motion sickness pills before even playing a VR game. And the very first comment in any a VR like game review is whether or not it made them sick. Like that is the number one thing. So um, you really have to be super careful with VR games in the Japanese market. Well, great. Uh, thank you. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Chito Aureliano, if you like to ask directly, thank you. All right. Can you hear me, you all? All right. Thank you all for sharing your, your knowledge in your talks. I love them. Uh, I have a, an, a very honest polemic question to ask because I'm a very small indie developer and I have a very small company and I am about to release my very text extensive 
JRPG game. I want to go to to Asia market, but I have I, I must make a, um, a decision like between China and Japan, just for start, because I cannot afford uh, localizing the game for the two nations at once. So, um, what are your opinion on that? Ah, the platforms. I, I plan to release them the game in Steam, Microsoft Store, and Nintendo Switch. What would be the wisest thing to do, on your opinion? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's a good question. And uh, actually, uh, first of all, I think you know that, uh, how can I say, in order to uh, raise a game is in the, uh, China officially, you need a license, right? But uh, actually, at the same time, they have a kind of informal distribution chain <laughs> for the Chinese uh, game users, actually. But uh, yeah, it's a kind of the uh, unstable. I mean, that uh, how can I say? Yeah, some people say yeah, it's it it will close for the near future like that. But uh, it hasn't closed yet. So I I don't know if it can uh, if it close or uh, open. Uh, for the uh, next next few years, uh, so uh, yeah, I I think uh, for the uh, uh, simplified Chinese uh, yeah uh, market is uh, how can I say uh, yeah uh, it, it it is a big market, but actually it's risky, yeah. And uh, as for the completed Chinese market, it's small, but uh, uh, you mean you say that the. It, you want to translate into the simplified Chinese or quickly a uh, complicated Chinese? Which one? The continental simplified simplified okay, Chinese. Sim yeah. Okay, got it, got it. Yes, uh, it's much bigger market. So I see. So then, yeah. Um, in, in shortly, uh, the how can I say Chinese market uh, is big but risky, and uh, uh, as for if you have a good uh, good how can I say a publisher or the uh, for example if you have a Good, uh, good publisher uh, from uh, Chinese game, uh, Chinese game, uh, Ch Chinese uh, continent. Then maybe it it might be a option. I think, yeah, yeah. In in my opinion. So how uh, how about you, uh, 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 the uh, Jackson and Jensen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's. Uh, I think it's obviously. I understand. You know your concerns, and that's a really difficult choice to make because you know there's pros and there's cons on both sides. Um, you know, naturally, I look at the Chinese market as you know there's such a massive chance there. Um, you know, to have bigger success just because of the sheer number of, of people playing games and the pure size of the market. But you know, wisely, as Satosan pointed out, it is such a risky market, right? Like, who knows when all of a sudden you can't even sell your game anymore? Um, so that's obviously a challenge as well. Um, so yeah, I think the the thing is, there's just again, there's so many factors, um, and you know, again, localization. Like, how many words is the game roughly? Do you know? Do you have like a word count or? Uh, over 10,000 words. Okay, I mean, 10,000, that's actually not uh, not that bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, because Switch, obviously, you know, great, uh, great platform um, in Japan. Um, it really just comes down to it. Like, if I was, you know, without knowing your game or anything like that, I would just say like, is this a game that one, like has a unique voice for a JRPG? Um, it's doing something different. It can kind of stand alone. Um, and is it something that, you know, for, for what it is, for the type of experience that you're trying to provide, you know, is it that, you know, really dialed in, like really, really high quality kind of experience? If it's something where you're like, okay, it's indie, it's something that, you know, I'm really proud of for what it is. It's a small game. Um, it's something that I put a lot of love and effort into, but maybe it doesn't really compare to like something, you know, obviously from a, from a bigger company. Um, I just think it's going to be really difficult kind of in that JRPG space. But it really comes down to you know kind of how much cost you're looking at you know for the to release in the Japanese market. Um, but as yeah, as an RPG, it really feels like you know especially in Switch, Steam, that without um, having a you know a local partner, it would just probably be very very difficult um, to have much success here. So you know given what it is, just kind of taking both markets just at face value, I would actually probably say China, uh, just because there's a greater chance for success. Uh, Zach, uh, if I may, 
just ask a question regarding that. Uh, uh, may, maybe uh, hearing what he he has, listening to what he has said, I was thinking about a game about like uh, uh, Eastward. Uh, yeah. That it's a JRPG style, but it was developed by a Taiwanese company or Hong Kong. Oh, it's company. Chinese. Yeah. So uh, just wondering, how, how successful was that in Japan? Do you have an idea? Um, so yeah, I mean, people really loved it, and I think uh, one of the main reasons is that. Uh, kind of aesthetically, it's clearly something that was a labor of love for many, many, many years. Um, the devs worked on it, I believe, for eight years. Um, so a huge amount of time um, in production. Um, and I also think that even though they're not Japanese, there is still certain kind of a certain aesthetics that Asian uh, gamers maybe kind of appreciate. Um, and just the really, really fine attention to detail um, within the pixel art. Um, but in terms of gameplay, I actually think that uh, you know, there's a lot of elements of it that didn't necessarily fit with the Japanese market. Um, and that what people really kind of embraced was uh, the visuals and the story side of things. Um, so the game definitely succeeded. We uh, we actually published ourselves as Kakiyashi Games, um, a physical version of the game, um, which has you know definitely been selling really well for us. Um, but in some ways we think a lot of people are actually kind of importing the Japanese physical version from overseas, right? It's not all coming from the Japanese market. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a game that for people who really love pixel art um, and people who love kind of a certain era of video games, um, it's something that you know they absolutely love and it's one of their favorite games of all time. But if you're looking at like mass market, uh, that's something where it probably doesn't really hit those kind of numbers. Great. Uh, let's move forward uh, to the last uh, two questions. Uh, Filippi Roveroni would like to ask you directly. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah. All right. So uh, have you heard about the, isn't new, a new tool, but the live 2D animation that it's becoming really famous between uh, mobile games. And I would like to ask if uh, it's worth to uh, invest in those uh, kind of animations. Uh, I think they, uh they made it to make uh cheaper to make animations and i've heard i've seen a lot of uh live studio animations like in colorful palette the mobile game uh, from hatsune miko and i think ghost frontline and others other titles like that so if there is a future on that and it's worth to invest in it. Uh, I I I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell uh, about you know what. I think that the the tr it's easier it's easier to see trends for for Japanese gaming here if you're going to um, <clears throat> events like Bits on it or or like local events like Tokyo Indies or Kyoto Indies or stuff like that. You can kind of see what kind of technology people are using at the end or like what kind of games are being submitted i haven't really seen like an explosion of live 2d art in games but it definitely you know makes a lot of production cheaper for companies that aren't going to you know they can't invest in like a lot of outsourcing for 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 2d animation so in that sense if it's going to make your game look you know different or unique then yeah it's a good investment for you to have to to know a new technology um i can't i can't predict if it's going to like just even looking at the games that we have for submissions for bit summit this this cycle i haven't really seen a lot of games that or seen any games that kind of make use of it yet i haven't gone through everything either though but because i don't see like this trend i don't i don't think that it's like uh it's in everybody's bag and you're gonna have to do it but that's actually good you know if, if you do it better than somebody else or more uniquely than somebody else uh um outside of like the traditional spaces of like vtubers or hasane mitu or something like that um, then it's a good investment for you. I mean, it kind of helps you power your style. Okay. Uh, Zach, uh, sure would like to add something to it? I actually 100% agree with John, so <laughs> nothing else to add. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, let's move to the last uh, question then. Uh, Daniel Caldas, welcome to the floor. Yeah, it's me again. <laughs> I just have a, a very quick uh, second question. Uh, it's quite 
quite a different question from from what people are asking is about hiring Japanese developers. I mean, with the pandemic, we have like this kind of uh, shift in the market where more people are you know working from home and and all that. And I was thinking here, okay, so I want to reach a Japanese market. The best one of the best ways for me to create a product that is you know uh, aimed to the market is to have Japanese developers working with me and what i would like to know is how difficult it is to hire you know a japanese developer or artist from from japan to work from home what right so, so we can do the the project entirely online um is that like a cultural uh resistance to that kind of approach uh what what are you i'm curious on what is your are your guys uh, vision on that thank you uh, so yeah, the two word answer is very hard. Um, yeah, so I think just culturally, uh, that's a really challenging thing. There's already, I think it's difficult um, in Japan for people to even go indie already and do things on their own. Uh, a lot of people here, you're kind of taught, you go to university, you get your first job, you stay with that company until you retire, right? Um, so for people to break free and go indie anyways and work freelance and work on their own is already kind of a difficult thing. Um, but I would just say, you know, communication, uh, you know, just general language skill is just going to be a massive problem. Um, I think there's people who would love to kind of collaborate and you know, do more stuff, um, but maybe there's going to be a bit worried about them being a bit shy and a bit, you know, kind of nervous about whether or not that they can communicate well enough, things like that. So I think it's it's a it's obviously an interesting idea and it's an interesting approach. And if you want to succeed in the Japanese market, then collaborating with, you know, <laughs> Japanese developers is obviously one way to do it. Um, kind of, I think, you know, there is Japanese, bigger Japanese companies are starting to become a bit more open and willing to work with, uh, with Western companies on collaborations. Um, so that's something you can kind of look to in the future. But uh, yeah, I think if you wanted to just hire a Japanese artist or, you know, hire a Japanese programmer or something like that, um it would be it'd be very very difficult um especially if you didn't have any kind of pre-existing relationship with them and just kind of starting fresh that would be really really hard uh in my uh okay uh, uh in my point of view uh how can i say uh, how can i say as for the big bigger companies uh yeah it is it is true that uh, how can i say they uh, making a lot of how can i say outsourcing or the joint work with uh, international game companies uh, like for example they they do outsourcing to the uh, chinese game companies or like the southeastern asian game companies or indian game companies yeah uh, in order to how can i say make a part of their their games and uh yeah, they take more importance on the kinds of customer written, I think. And the uh, interesting thing is that, how can I say, uh, it, yeah, it is true that uh, there is a kind of uh, cultural difference or the language difference, but uh, sometimes the cult uh, contract culture is different even among the Japanese game companies. Uh, for example, uh, do you know Konami uh, renews their each of the uh, employees' uh, email address every year. So you need to, how can I say, check with the, uh, how can I say, the, the uh, economy person for the, uh, how, how about the new email address or like that. So yeah, but uh, yeah, so, 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 yeah, but uh, in other companies, they don't have such a culture, right? And uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, how can I say, yeah, it's a little bit uh, tougher than working with uh, Western company, Western uh, big game companies. But uh, once you get the kinds of confidence uh, between the Japanese game, uh, game companies, then maybe you can make a, a long-term friend, I think, I believe so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I think we have to, I, I know we have another question. Uh, maybe I'll send these questions directly to our speakers and they, if they have the time, they can, they can maybe address them later. Uh, I'll, like to as we conclude our webinar today first i'd like to thank our speakers for their excellent thought-provoking presentations were really great and they really complemented each other so i was really happy about it and also most importantly our participants uh, maybe later i could share some uh contact information other marketing material from from uh, our three speakers i'm sure many of our the developers here today would like to 
you know about uh, going to to Beat Summit or about working for Hashi or maybe connecting with Sho to 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 contact bigger Japanese companies. So uh, it would be great to to help foster these connections. Um, please also uh, contact us here, the Embassy of Brazil in Tokyo, if you have plans to bring your game to Japan. We will more, more, we'll be more than happy to to help you to 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 be with you in this process. Um, and well, that's what we have today. We had a great session. Thank you very much. Good night to everyone in Brazil, and a uh, good day for us in Japan. And arigatou gozaimashita. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye.